Now, that is, that is awesome, but I, I did not come through my slides. There were so many good pictures and charts and things in, um, in the Iggy uh, book, the Ned Surge book. And, and I really, so I did make reference to, to some of those um, in, in my slides. So, and I just did this because um, the, my, um, the picture that I had on the, the, the last PowerPoints was just fundamentals. But we're using several different um, uh, resources. And so I'm just going to credit all of them right here up front just so I don't get in trouble for being for stealing other people's work or whatever. So anyway, our our um, our skin. Well, this actually I'm probably going to go backwards here because there's something on the um, the first page is there on the notes. And I'm sorry I was so late getting posted and just I just got into those other books so much looking at some things and I thought well I'm just going to make sure that I I refer to them. All right, and I can see. Better if I get back here, so see what y'all are seeing. All right, and what part of this at the um, the skin is is part of the concept of body protection. We don't always think of it that way, but it really, really is. That's one of our first lines of defense against infection. We have some white blood cells that do that too, but that means that's usually after the skin integrity or tissue integrity has been impinged upon in some, in some way, or our, our mucous membranes have, have taken on germs or whatever. So we, we need to um, realize on this notes page that we've got um, an integumentary system as skin, hair, and nails, and sebaceous and sweat, and mammary glands, and um, that we need to, as nurses, maintain skin integrity and promote wound healing, and that, that's just introductory kinds of things. Um, there's, there's some... Um, I guess controversy maybe as to what impaired tissue integrity means. Does that just mean that it goes like to the subcutaneous tissue or can it be any other other tissues? I know in one of the places, I, th I think it was fundamental, it says that, it can, that you can include it as connective tissue, which is, includes cartilage and bone and all that sort of thing. But most of the time you're talking about tissue integrity, then you're, you're talking about um, the, the, the top of the skin, the, the surface area, the, the um, mucous membranes and corneal areas, and then um, down to the subcutaneous. But I tell my students in, um, they're, they're doing like hip, hip replacement um, patients and trying to figure out the nursing diagnosis. I, I would still say um, to your tissue integrity because it is, even if they just got a broken bone and they haven't had the surgery yet and you don't have anything on the skin surface, and you, but you've got bruising, there's tissue damage there, you know, with bruising and with, with the pain and with the swelling and all that. And so I, I, I do use it um, uh, for, for deeper kind of tissue injuries. <laughs> so, but just keep in mind that, that um, the tissue types are um, epithelial, which would be the skin, um, uh, connective, neural, and muscle. And epithelial could be like in, in the, your mucous membranes and all as well. So, um, so sometimes tissue injury can go beyond the subcutaneous to muscle and the internal organs and the bone. So um, in the Giddens book, in the concept book, she has this little thing. This really does, it's not very colorful. It just says partial thickness and, and then up um, to the full thickness. And it has these little arrows. But a full thickness would be more So um, that's, um, I guess we'll, we'll just tend We'll just continue to maybe agree to disagree sometimes on exactly what is tissue <laughs> integrity, but um, it really could go go much deeper than the subcutaneous. Okay, so normally um, our our skin protects us, of course, and then the nerves and the, the skin enable that our our touch and our pain and our pressure and our heat and cold and body it, it regulates our body temperature and our our skin synthesizes uh, vitamin D. And we can take it in as well you know, with milk products and, and um, other uh, mushrooms that vitamin D. Is that right? I think the notes got like two cents. Because it said something like, it's the, it's the vegetable that has the, the uh, greatest amount of uh, vitamin D in it or something like that naturally. I'm like, vegetable? Oh, it's a fungus. It's, 
Oh, and just, just as an aside, this is really gross, but um, I saw on this TV show the other day that, that they are actually making these special body bags for, for human corpses that, that um, they, you just wrap the corpse in this body bag. It must have some sort of growth medium or, or I don't know exactly what it's made out of, but that, that you grow mushrooms on it. And I was telling my husband this weekend, after seeing that show last week, I'm like, you know, I guess that it takes a whole lot less energy than cremation and all that. It just would become mushrooms, I guess. But it still sounds like gross. I mean, I got some mushrooms this weekend. I'm like, what's it for that? Oh, I'm like, you can't put And so he doesn't take all that energy because he had to um, and raise the body to like 100, what are they like 21,000 degrees or something like that to yeah. cremate? It's, it's a tremendous, you know, condition anyway. And so this takes a lot of energy. And then the enzyme hangs out. But then again, if you can eat a great medium to the mushrooms, it's like all these astronomers say that we're all made of stuff that came from the stars. Well, that's not something that works. That's gross. I don't know. I may tell my husband to make me a mushroom, uh, mushroom uh, medium or whatever. Anyway, um, some of this, um, the the skin, we we really do, and you know we've got pain and pleasure with our with our skin. You know how good a back rub feels, and how good it feels for somebody to wash hair or. Just something like that. That, that really puts me to death to get my hair washed. And somebody would have, somebody would have my hair washed. That's the best thing in the world. So our skin is really a, something that we really um, value. But of course, we have our skin. I kind of wish it wasn't there. All right, here. slides here. I have got references to 
to lots of other pictures. And sometimes when I look at, at pictures of these things, this is kind of hard to see. And this is sweat gland, hair follicle, blood vessels. You can see it better on your own computer. And there's epidermis, dermis, and then the fat is a Q layer. But um, the Iggy has, uh, in chapter 26, there's, there's um, a, a real detailed review of, of all the skin um, um, anatomy and physiology. And, and it's, it is really, really more detailed than we have to go into now because I, I think everybody in here has had anatomy and physiology now, right? I think that's, that's happened. So, so you should, this, it should be reviewed, but, but I still would recommend flipping through Iggy because the charts and the, um, and the pictures can maybe speak to you in a different way, especially the pictures. It's <coughs> Yeah, okay. Yeah. I think that's just pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah. It's all, but it, it diffuses from the dermis, from the blood vessels in the dermis. So, so that's just, that's pretty cool. Um, and here, see, it's got blood vessels here. The blood vessels are just way down down there in, in the dermis, but it diffuses up into the epidermis. So I never really heard it described like that before, but the picture pretty much says that, doesn't it? It's not about the diffusion part. But. Anyway, you can y'all can uh, look at, at all those different layers, and I'm not worried about the that you memorize the path layer, 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 whatever. That's not necessarily what we're after now. This is just to where you look a little bit and let us understand what's going on there. But um, the kids have some really really um, colorful illustrations too, and y'all that was a lot of fun. And it does tell you about stratum corneum, stratum lucidum, stratum, all this stuff, and, and let you kind of see that there are <coughs> multi layers within the, the layer. There's the stratum basali, that's the the bottom, and then there's our epidermis and dermis and sub Q again. But this gives you more uh, with the cutout. It's got got a nerve here, an artery here, a vein that's blue. Um, you got a hair root right there, and the, the follicle. Um, the ecron sweat gland. I mean, I think this is a really, really good, good picture too. So that that could kind of help you to to just review. And then again, I've, I've got some references listed on and page numbers and figure numbers from from me and and guys. Okay. Um, the skin integrity, we do have lots of lots of factors that affect it, of course. Um, genetics is one thing with our skin color and, and um, how sensitive it's our skin to light and, and whether we have any, any allergies to the certain substances or certain things in the environment. And um, really older people and, and very young people, the, especially like premature infants, are going to be much more sensitive um, to their skin and um, somebody a young child or, or a young adult. And uh, women's usually feel different in, in um, uh, infants and young children, though, because they, they do have the regeneration capacity that, that even, even younger adults um, that may not hear quite as quickly as these infants and children would if, as long as they're, they're full term infants. Um, and then the illness and treatments, if you've got, um, got circulation problems or medications that affect the skin, um, like steroids make the skin thin if you if you uh, use it for a long time. Oh, I told y'all this before, but my, my daughter had had uh, um, some diaper rash, irritation, and the carrying of and, and, and um, you know, sometimes when some things that you eat or drink have a lot of acid in them, and that can affect your irritation as well. But um, the doctor gave me a, um, a prescription for something that they're making. They just told me what to get over the counter. Use it for like seven days, but stop. Do not use it all the time. Don't use steroid cream all the time, all the day, because it will make their, their perineal area thin, and it's going to be really, really difficult to get it to regenerate because it's going to have that, you know, the urine in the, in the stool um, touching it and all that for, for a long time, and it's going to be very difficult to, to get back to where it once, once was, the, 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 the uh, thickness of the mucous membrane. So, so uh, you have to be very careful with, with steroids. But some, some people have to have steroids uh, continuously, but they're, they're going to have some thin skin. 
And then we, we do have, um, have the psychosocial part of our skin, but we want to we want to look good. We have our, our body image. We want to love ourselves. We want other people to love us because of the way we look. We want to be attracted to other people. And then um, the body image is really the thing to do. That can really affect people's quality of life if they don't have a positive body image. So, and the skin really does play a huge factor. Okay, and in the um, in, in aging, um, on the next page here, um, we have more fragile skin with rougher, drier appearance. I, my hands are getting so much drier. I know my hair is drier, and all, I can really tell, tell the difference from when I was younger. And then there, the, the healing takes longer in older people. Um, they have those hyperkeratoses, those kind of kind of um, rough spots that um, are sort of exposure to sea salt damage. Um, and then skin cancers are more likely in older people. Um, and there's an increased inflammatory response, so, so healing is, is um, that's the best of body after the body has been And there's um, over a, a period of a lifetime, you can develop lots of sensitivities, not necessarily allergies, but just irritant reactions to, to lots of chemicals and things like that in our environment as you get older. And then um, the, the sun exposure has, has greater effect on, on the, the more fragile skin in, in the age of people. And uh, they don't have the, quite the capacity of um, being able to, to uh, produce the vitamin D. So, I think I'll only take a five minute break and think that. Are y'all okay with some of this? This one done yesterday, but. Um, we were, we're still talking about the age-related factors, and I just wanted to bring out a couple more things with the, the dermis and, and all that. I guess I need my, my flipper thing, clicker thing. Okay, and our dermis is the, um, the, the, the next layer under the epidermis, <coughs> but it's, it's greater susceptibility to dry skin when um, somebody is, is older, and the sensation, um, can be dulled because of um, some aging of a neurological system, and so that. So, what would if you have some decreased sensation? What might be some risk factors for for older people? Burns, right. burns, yeah. Or we had a. Um, well, if you have decreased sensation because of like long term and extensive um, diabetic neuropathy, um, what what might what might be a risk factor too besides burns? You might not even know, yeah, that you have an injury. We had a, a patient, did somebody else have something we all to say something else or was that the same thing? Yeah, yeah, infection might be there and if you don't even, my, my father-in-law had an infection in his foot and, and he, the podiatrist was watching it and his um, primary care doctor, they were watching it, but just kind of all of a sudden kind of flared up, but, but he, you know, he had been just looking at it once a week or something, and really people, he, he is um, one of those sort of, I guess he is diabetic, but he's really like, he can, can, um, can control it with diet primarily, but he does have some neuropathy, that's how it actually started, when they, they realized that when you're like 130 consistently for a number of years of fasting, that's too high, and then you, you can get neuropathy at that at that particular point. So, so um, anyway, he he didn't realize that it was flaring up, and then he ended up having to to go to the, the hospital over over Christmas and everything every single day to get antibiotics. And he had a pick line and all this, and and um, the, to get it straightened out. But um, we had a patient that had. Um, she, she was seeing us for like a hematological condition, the ITP, the um, thrombocyte, let's see, 
idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, so just say ITP because that other one's such a mouthful. But, but anyway, she was getting um, medications to, to it, it was an autoimmune sort of thing, and so we had to give her some, some um, IVIG, and we gave her all kinds of chemo drugs to try to suppress her immunity so that her platelets would stay um, somewhat um, in a normal range or close to it. But she, she had been a diabetic for years, a, a type 2 diabetic, and she had had her, her um, house re-roofed, and she was just kind of, she lived by herself, I think, before she was the main, main person that made the decisions in the household anyway. And she went outside, and she had shoes on, but she was walking around, you know, seeing how, how everything was looking. And it was like several days later that she, she found that she had a roofing nail up in her foot and didn't even know it. She'd been walking around with it because she couldn't feel it. And, and I mean, that was, that was really, really... So that was kind of like this one little girl didn't have any feelings about she was born like that. The, so that could have been a, so that wasn't a doctor. Yeah, that was kind of watching all the time because they didn't want to burn herself. And there's other, yeah, there's other reasons besides diabetes. That's just a comma, but yeah, you can be born. That, that was, so, that's really, really risky, isn't it? If you can't even, okay, you realize how thankful you are sometimes for pain because it is a, it's a warning that you need to, to intervene and do something a lot of times. So, and the pain can go out of whack with things like fibromyalgia when there's not anything obviously wrong and your, your nervous system goes over overboard versus being under, like the one you're describing. But anyway, that we have to think about that for not necessarily only for older people, but it's just more prevalent in older people. So, the greater risk for injury, of course, um, and then we have to be careful about about exposure to heat and cold because the, if they don't have that good sense and their skin is thinner and that sort of thing, then you're, you're going to um, have, have greater injury from, from um, the, the extremes of temperature. Um, and then the, the decreased tone and elasticity. And y'all, I, I can't remember which book now because I read in, in all three of their, those texts, but, but the elasticity does make a difference. When you've got a really elderly patient and you're doing skin turner, sometimes it tends to Anyway, doesn't it? I mean, you don't really know for sure if it's an older person, whether it's got the dehydration, or is it just because they're they don't have that elasticity, it's just not going to bounce back as quickly. So, so um, certainly do do keep that in mind and see if there are other ways or other places on the body that, that you can maybe check the turner to to and, and look at the mucous membranes. If the mucous membranes look look drier, then that that can be an issue. So anyway. Um, Okay, so um, are you getting old? Okay, let's let's turn it back. <laughs> Sorry about that. you see it um, in a in a photo rather than it just being a um, just words on a page. And um, okay. Oh, we were talking about see with the subcutaneous um, tissue um, uh, in older people that some of the um, subcutaneous tissue atrophies are getting thinner. Like I can really tell on my face that I've got real high cheekbones and everything. And, but I used to have more more flesh over these these cheekbones. I hadn't lost weight; it's just coming off of off of some places and going up places. But but um, I, it's just like I, I'm, I've just got thinner skin over um, areas up in my face, um, and then it's like your hands and, and your neck and uh, the lower legs. But then the, the, um, the um, abdominal subcutaneous tissue increases in men and women, and um, the thighs. Anyway, we do have, in this 
center of gravity is resting and, and that sort of thing and, and do how often should we turn people? Yeah. 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 At least two hours, right? Um, and then there can be cellulite formation. Even younger people can have cellulite formation, but um, the, in, in older people it, it can be uh, more obvious sometimes. So, And then we have dry skin um, because our, our glands aren't producing oil as much as they used to. And then we don't perspire as much either. So if you don't perspire as much, what can you have? Overheat. Yeah, you can overheat. You can have some, some hypothermia um, problems or heat. You have heat exhaustion and heat stroke in the light. Okay, our alterations. Um, we, I don't think that this is, I think most of this, these kind of things are pretty um, pretty common knowledge, but the, the skin lesions of primary and secondary, that's something that we need to, to realize that, that um, sometimes we, we have a, I, I never have poison ivy or poison on my face, and one time I guess I got on my hand and then I scratched my face. And then I, then I kept, kept messing with it because it's just right there in my face and it hits just and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff and I just kept on um, mm -hmm. scratching with my fingernails. And what, what do fingernails have underneath them? Yeah. 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 Staph and stretch and all that kind of stuff, particularly the staph um, skin organisms. Well, I ended up getting, getting impetigo um, all, all over my face. It was just the, 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 like this kind of scaly um, rash on, on where the the, um, the poison ivy had been, and it was oozy. I mean, it was, it was so gross. It was just really nasty. But children get that a lot, but because children don't don't always uh, listen when they say don't scratch. Well, I was like 20 or something. I think I did that. I was I was not really young anyway, not, not a young child, and, and I still didn't think about, about that uh, as a potential infection. Okay, and of course we, we can look at the, um, the causes of, of the of skin lesions on the notes page. But I think it's really, really interesting. Um, this is another Iggy thing that is so so interesting. I put it on the notes page. I think I, I think I got it on there. I wrote it down on my notes, but I think I typed it on y'all's. Did I put that about um, the chart about common alterations in skin color on mm -hmm. um, it's table 26-2? And it really, really, I think that would help you a lot if you have... Um, to be assessed your patient and you're trying to, to figure out what to put in SIM card or what may be going on and all that sort of thing. I think that's a really, really great resource. So, so take a look at that. Um, uh, and then the uh, common, common clinical findings in uh, skin palpation um, is, is really, really um, a, a good resource too, where you're talking about edema and moisture and temperature and turgor and texture. And you learn to do all that in physical assessment, but it really just gives you some some real good tips and details in, in that as well. And then um, I think that another thing in the Iggy was that skin assessment techniques for, um, for patients with darker skin tones and that um, when if you're trying to assess pallor or um, or even like redness or jaundice, it, it can look different. So, so you need to, to um, well, if, if you can look at that section, I think it'll help you too. But, but some of the, the high points were that you can look at the mucous membranes and the nail beds and, and all for, for, um, for pallor and cyanosis and, and all, because it is an obvious. Um, I think, I think President Obama rips the blue a lot of times just when I'm seeing on TV. And y'all, I mean, it's not, it's not cyanotic, it's just the way it is. Yeah. But they, it's not exactly blue, but it's not, I don't know, it, it's just, a, he's just genetically got those melanocytes, you know, there's larger enough melanocytes in, 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 um, in, in his lips, and, and so um, it, they, it just has sort of a, a bluish tone sometimes, and the first one I saw, I thought, gosh, there's something wrong with it, but it's, it's not, that's normal for him. So we have to, we have to make sure and look at other, other places and not make an assumption, look at the whole
covered well in the, um, the other one. I just kind of got excited about finding all those things that are a little bit different and, and very helpful. Okay, um, the, there are um, some of these in, in um, Iggy as, as well. And, and their, their illustrations are just a little bit different. This is a Pearson version. This one actually is the same thing that's in, in your book. I'm pretty sure it's exactly the same as what's in your book. It's just that it was, it was on a, in a different chapter in the book that we used last year, but it, it looked like it was exactly the same thing. So um, these are the, the kinds of lesions, the macule, um, macules and papules or plaques. Um, and the, the, it gives all the descriptions of, of um, and, and the, of course the pictures too. And I think it, um, the, the one in Iggy, just just makes it look a little bit different. It's got a little sort of like cross section that's a little bit different, but it, it might help you to to um, understand. And a wheel is kind of like a um, like hives. A wheel, but a wheel is what you make when you're actually doing a what the in, interdermal, right? Yeah, when we're doing the the TV test. Did you have a question? Oh, okay, Chef. Iggy is our man's age, but right. Right, right. Okay. Sorry, sorry. It's her name is Ignatum Vicious or something oh, okay. like that. So it's like if you if you can say it in an easier way, everybody calls her Iggy, and she even calls herself that. I've heard her of webinar things she did one time, and they just introduced her as Iggy. I think so. Yes, sir. worry about, I'm, I'm not going to hold you responsible for knowing all the measurements of it. Just know the idea that, that a vesicle is like a blister, and a bullet is just a big blister. And, and I, is, that, is that the one you're talking about or other? Okay. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't worry about, about the, the huge difference, because most of the time people don't even use the bullet word, even though by definition it's, it really is a bigger kind of blister most of the time. So, it's a blister that's or fluid filled bleach that's whatever size and measure it rather than uh, to specifically call it a, a little. That's one of those things like our book of memory. People don't know that kind of much through that we learn it, but it's, it's not something that, that people you know, even on the history and physical the doctors will usually put that on there. It's just one of those that's it's out there but we don't don't use it so much. But, but just so you know that vesicles and bullets are both fluid filled and that the bullet is bigger than the, than the vesicle. But that, you know, the definition may vary a little bit. And then macules and, and patches are not necessarily exactly the same thing. The, the patch is just a, um, a lot of um, <coughs> ma uh, macules that have come uh, together. And patches are larger than one centimeter and may have an irregular border. So, but again, if you can describe what you're seeing and what the area is, and you you can say that if they're um, if they're all um, together or if they're if they're separated, if they're if, it, if it's just generalized all over the body or exactly what area of the body it is, describe what you see. If you if you can't remember what you call it, describe what you see exactly what you see, and, and that will um, that will be um, better than trying to just guess at what word it is and then maybe maybe getting it wrong or maybe being misinterpreted by somebody else. But um, but anyway, if you see these these terms, then you'll you'll sort of know what you're what you're talking about. So let me see if there's anything else that. Yeah, the diffuse fluid in the tissues is the, the wheel thing. And, and when we, we put, it's not diffuse, we just have a, that little single um, wheel that we, we make when we're doing our, our intradermal. So, and then um, there, the secondary skin lesions, um, that's atrophy and it makes, it, makes the skin wrinkly. And um, that it is from wasting. It can, can be from, from age, but atrophy can, can mean wasting in, in anybody. Like you can have atrophy of... Um, skin and muscle um, from um, from other conditions and all um, like if, if it's a problem with collagen and elastin, which are which give give more form to the to the skin and the elasticity, and then erosion is wearing away, um, and so you can have I don't know if this is erosion. This is not, I, I have all these scratches and stuff on my. Well, it is. It says scratch marks. I guess that's an erosion, huh? Looks like a cat scratch. But we were hiking this this weekend, and there were all these these briar, not even bushes. It's just like this this sprig of, of briars. And and I'd be looking out at the mountains and stuff, and and I'd just be swinging my arms, and it'd go rip, you know, just the, just I'd hit the briar bushes. But um, anyway, um, and I got a got a skin place on my knee. I guess that's an erosion too. When when you um. 
if you get like a uh, like a carpet burn or road rash or whatever, that's that's erosion um, when it, it, it um, uh, doesn't extend way into the dermis and it doesn't scar or anything, but it makes it it can be sort of oozy and and gross um, for a while just because that top layer is gone. And then uh, an ulcer, I think we all know what ulcers are, that it is it is a deeper kind of thing when it's an ulceration that goes into deeper tissues. Um, and then the, um, the fissure, and that, that can happen when you get like corner, the, they call it chelosis, that's not on, on here, but you may see that as a side effect of medication sometimes, it's C-H-E-I, L-O-S-I-S. -S. Has y'all seen that before it was a, as a drug side effect yet? Because you can, sometimes you'll see that word, and, but that's, it's a fissure like the, the cracks at the corner of the mouth. Um, and then, um, and like athlete's foot cr has cracks. Um, let me think, who, who had that 25 year old patient that had the, had the, the cellulitis the, because of the cracks? It, so that, that was, that was me. Oh, that's right, that's right. That, he was that really young, really young guy, and he said yeah. that's how it started when he was like yeah. eight years old or something. Or, yeah, it was and like he had a real bad athlete's foot, and he was real obese even as a child. And right. so he didn't, when he had all that athlete's foot, it didn't heal very well, and he was susceptible to the fungal infection and the crack, and then he got cellulitis in the deeper tissues, and, and now it's recurrent, 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 and yeah. he stays in the hospital. It's, it was so sad, but that, that can happen. It was so young. Yes, Amanda. Um, my patient had um, cellulitis because of, mm -hmm. he had um, charcoal marine tube syndrome, mm -hmm. which is a deformation in his feet, oh. and it was like drying up. So his, his um, bone, the arch in his foot was like this. Oh. So the balls of his feet and his heels were always like... He had different it, pressure points. Yeah, different pressure points that were on the outside. And um, he didn't really, I guess, pay attention to a cut that was on his skin and he got cellulitis mm -hmm. and an infection went to his bone. Oh my so, yeah, so that's osteomyelitis. Yeah, myelitis. And he um, ended up having to get that section of his foot cut off. They oh. saved the rest of it, but I guess he had yeah, we saw a lot of amputation was, stuff with our so patients too. Yeah, they either had them before or oh, yeah, it's interesting. And it's really yeah. sad that yeah. somebody's going to have that chronically mm -hmm. and all that. But they can, there's not a whole lot they can do to, to prevent it when they're, they're in that, that kind of shape. And I don't know that the Angelus guy can ever really lose weight either because he can't be active and, and he gets so he has activity intolerance. So, and he's 25 years old. And he's got this really young looking face. He's got a really handsome yeah, face. Handsome. And and all that, and you still wonder how that happens to people, but it, it, it doesn't, it's not necessarily just old people. So, um, anyway, the, the primary and secondary lesions in the Eagle book, or the pictures are on page 460 and 461. I, 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 just, I didn't print it all out. I'm trying to save trees, and so I'm repetitive. That's what I wrote it down. And then, let's see, the other. Other secondary lesions can, can be that. I think that's fun about that, like chemification. That's a fun word, but it's not a good thing to have. But um, it, it does, you know how lichens are like on trees and rocks and everything, and they're just kind of like flaky. You can flake it off, and, and um, it, lichens are, are from, um, from algae <coughs> and fungi, fungus together. That's, that's what makes lichens. And, but anyway, that um, it, it does look like lichens on, on the skin, and that can be a chronic dermatitis kind of thing. And then, then um, scales, dry skin, then dandruff, and you know how dandruff flakes off. And, and uh, if it's a, a big patch of it, 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 it really can, you can see that it's, it's a layer, that it's a scale. And eczema can do like that too. I used to have it in the back of my head. But I was in high school, and then it went away for a while, and then I had it for about 20 years, until about two years ago I went to the dermatologist just for a skin check since I'm so freckly and fair and all that kind of thing, and and he he just said, you know what, just just take take your hands off of it, quit that. It's just like what I did with my poison ivy. I just picked at it and all that, and, and I had some eggs in my ear, and he said the same thing. Keep your fingers out of your ear and keep your fingers out of your hair. Just just stop it, and and I, I made myself stop, and, and it really worked. So so that's one of those things. Just just quit. Just quit messing. <coughs> and then, then crust is when you've got like um. um that's what I had, like with that that oozy stuff with the with the, the tigo, 
but uh, and that's what it says, eczema and vitigo. You can have it with with herpetic lesions, um, and and like with shingles, that can that can be sort of a, a crusty type of thing too. Once the the blisters, the vesicles um, dry up, start to dry up, and it can be um, scabs too. That's that's a crust, and then of course we know what scarring is, but the keloid is the elevated. Um, darkened area. It's when it when you kind of go your scar formation goes goes kind of hyper, and so you can, you can get it from ear per, ear piercings or surgery or, or other injuries too that are that are trying to heal up, but your body kind of goes goes hyper on the the healing process. Okay, let's go to the types of wounds. Do we have intentional and, and unintentional? And unintentional is, is of course something that's just accidental and that we don't mean for it to happen. And then we have closed wounds and open wounds. Um, you've got a closed wound that's trauma without a break in the skin. We may have bruising and all, but, but you don't have any opening on the skin surface, but there's still damage underneath. There are strains or sprains um, in the, the deeper tissues that, that can, that's a closed. But then open is uh, where the skin or mucous membrane is exposed, of course, so that, that's pretty obvious. Okay, I do want you to. Um, Learn the difference between the clean and clean contaminated, contaminated and dirty or infected. Um, and uh, the, the contaminated, especially the, uh, a wound that's contaminated, would be if there's a large spillage into the, like if you have a, a burst diverticulum or a, a ruptured appendix, that's going to contaminate the abdominal cavity because of that rupture is spilling um, GI contents um, into, the, um, into the peritoneal area where it's supposed to be sterile. Um, so, so all of those germs and all that normal flora and all that kind of stuff is supposed to be contained in the, in the, um, the colon. And, or the the, uh, the small intestines and the and the large intestines. So if that if that gets broken, then that that is a that's contaminated. And then con, con, uh, clean contaminated is that it, it's a, a surgical um, that with respiratory, GI, genital, or urinary tracts are entered, but there's no infection. But you're just entering those areas um, that that um, are not sterile, and so that that's clean clean um, means it's not infected and it's primarily closed so that, that um, the respiratory GI and genital and urinary tracts um, are not entered. Now, urinary tracts should be um, sterile, but it isn't always in there. There's a potential that there could be um, infected urine in the, the bladder, even though it's not supposed to be, um, have, have bacteria in it. Right, and so they, they consider that to be um, the, uh, the contaminant as well. So, um, anyway, the, the um, classifying, um, I'll look at yours and see if I took that down. Okay, good. Um, the classifying wounds by depth, we, we do partial thickness and full thickness, and I think we talked about that a little bit yesterday about the, um, um, the, the little arrows that the Iggy was, was showing. It really didn't, didn't tell you a whole lot, but it does tell you that there are different degrees. Um, the partial uh, thickness, um, it, it will heal by regeneration, but if it's full thickness, it's going to, um, you might have to have the connective tissue repaired and then it's probably going to have a lot of scarring. So, um, so a, a really, really deep pressure ulcer is going to be a full thickness thing to stage four. And Amanda's going to show you a lot about that and we'll talk about that a lot as well. tomorrow. So, everybody will be here for that because it's, it's just. Because um, I always learn so much from you, even though I've heard her speak every year. There's always new things coming out and, and reinforcement of the things that we don't see very often, too. So, okay. Um, and then in, in uh, treated wounds, we need to monitor the, the progress of the healing when, when the dressings are changed. A lot of um, our philosophy at, for a long time with nursing was that we, we always. Um, loosen the dressing to look at the at the wound, but with some of these newer dressings, you're really not supposed to open it. It's, it's safer to just leave it closed up for like seven days and just monitor the area around the wound. Let's we'll see what um, Amanda says about some of those and which dressings that you absolutely need to leave leave them leave them be until the um, until it gets you know uh, soil or whatever, or until it's, it's ordered to be changed. Um, and, and or which ones that definitely need to be um, revealed and, and look at the one every, every day or every so many hours. And <coughs> to clarify that, she talks about, I think she talks about wound care too. 
Okay, and so again, this is the same chart. It says Table 530 5, but it's the same chart in Cozier. It's 36 1, um, page 920, so it's really it's the same information. But this, this is something that you do need to, to know. I mean, I think you know a lot of that. Incision is when you you know, open something up with a um, with a, a sharp object and a contusion. I don't know if you know that word, but contusion is is like um, it's it's a closed wound. But um, and then what's echematic mean or echomosis? Bruise. Yeah. So if it looks uh, blue or purple or whatever, uh, because of the damaged blood vessels underneath. But it is closed. It's not something that that's open that needs to be. Uh, have a uh, dressing over over the skin surface. You might have to do some um, like a uh, elastic bandage or something like that to reduce the, the swelling, but um, but it's not necessarily the um, in, not anything on the skin surface. And then abrasions are just like scrapes. And then the, a puncture wound laceration is a <coughs> is a, a cut when the, the tissues are, are torn apart, and that's you usually have to have like um, stitches. And, and um, it is an open wound, and that it, sometimes the edges are jagged, um, and it, it's harder to repair, and you can have more scarring if it's a jagged wound. Then a penetrating wound is like a like a, a bullet or or a, um, like a, a knife stab or, or something like that. So so just do do know be familiar with all of those mean. And, in the examples of it. I think that's probably something that you, you already know. Okay, let's let's do a two minute break. Um, there's a subject and an object too. Um, Jack, you know, you know, you know, things that you can actually see in the versus what the patient tells you. So you you got to do do all of that sort of thing. And, and you do have to be observant like the infants and children whether hygiene is a, a big deal, or whether they have any skin lesions, injuries, those those kinds of things, because they, they may not tell you about it, especially if they're used or something. You got to be be careful of about that, and, and that is one of those obligation to report kind of things. If you suspect it, even if it's not true, you still need to report it to your supervisor or go go by what your facility um, requires of you. But that's usually what you do. I think y'all learned that this channel unit that you are obligated. The nutrition does have a tremendous effect on our, our skin integrity and our, our healing, our wound healing and all. Um, and I'll let y'all look at the, the list of the diagnostic tests. The, the biggie um, is, is um, the, the lab data that if you've got decreased um, white blood cells, then you're not going to have as much um, um, immunity and it's not going to, you may not heal as well. White blood cells to fight any skin infections or prevent infection. Sometimes they, the, um, the neutrophils and all will, will keep the infection from ever ever happening. It's just when, when uh, something that's foreign comes into the body, then your um, white blood cells are supposed to come in and, and take care of it. Then um, I think Jennifer said she had been to Disney World before. Did, have you ever done that Body Wars thing? I don't think they even had it anymore at Disney World. Is it Epcot? It may, they had it. It's one of those motion sensor rods, but you're you're going through the the blood vessels and everything in this little capsule. They shrink you down on the on the film and everything, and, and you're in this little capsule going through the the blood vessels and everything, along with the white blood cells and the red blood cells and everything, you're going into to this place where the the um, the, the person that they're, in their, whose body they're in has a, a, a splinter. And so you're, you're trying to, to go with the white blood cells along and see, see what happens to, to try to engulf it into germs and all that. It's a really, really cool ride. And I, the last time we were there, it wasn't open. I don't know if they just took it away or if they were just beeping it up. I don't know. It, it was really, really cool. Called, called body wars. Okay. Anyway, um, if your hemoglobin's down, what are we? What's going to suffer? What's that? Yeah, what is, what is
there's our hemoglobin. We do much to do with those yeah, take <coughs> oxygen, right? So if you don't have oxygen, then we're going to have the perfusion issues, aren't we? The decreased oxygenation of our cells. Um, and then albumin is an indicator of the nutritional status of the protein. And then there's coagulation studies you can do um, if people are on blood thinners. Or uh, sometimes before um, patients go on blood thinners, doctors will take a, um, just a baseline test of PT and PTT um, just to see if there's any just underlying coagulation problems that that patient has, not that they're only at a coagulant. So you don't want to put them on that coagulant to find that or if there is infection, we want to treat it right away and then to promote our healing. And um, then there, there's some um, uh, variations in the pharmacological therapies. You're not giving any specific drugs that you have to know about, but that license sunburn, you can use pharmacotherapy, and eczema and dermatitis, you can use, use pharmacotherapy too. And a doctor did, did give me some uh, medication to put on my eczema. Then, then it's like, okay, put, put the medicine on and don't touch it. So, so that's uh, Jim Dugan. Not touching it would get, get more good than the, than the cancer that you take. So, and, and you may have some um, topical steroids or glucocorticoids as the, the same thing. And uh, potency will vary according to the severity of the, the condition. So, um, and then with alternative therapies, I've, I'll list it that. And I don't know that that's in the fundamentals, but I don't remember reading it there, but I had it in my previous contact and I left it there, but like, even in primrose oil can can help um, prevent some of the itchiness and dryness that you have with, with eczema and aloe vera gel. A lot of people, how many people have used aloe on birds, the burn plant? I mean, it's, it really helps to that. And my mom used aloe gel when she had radiation therapy, when she had it on breast cancer. And, um, and it, it just makes like a sunburn. Her, her um, lesion was like the right lower quadrant. So she would have radiation here in all, all, the, all the tax area. And it was like a, um, a darkened, um, it wasn't even tan, it just got, got more, really dark um, in color. A real, real flaky now, too. And, and since aloe gel is, is water soluble, you can use that with radiation therapy. But you have to make sure the therapist knows, knows what you're taking. And, those ingredients and all that, you know, I mean, anything that's not water soluble, um, so they need to, to know. But that, the doctor actually gave her from that particular aloe um, preparation. So anyway, and then chamomile can can um, help with skin inflammation too. And um, has anybody ever drunk the chamomile tea, like at bedtime or whatever? It is really, it really does. I, I should do that every night, and I forget because I feel like I'm not going to go to the bathroom all that. Now that latex problems can be a, a, a real severe allergic condition, um, but some people just have sort of the irritant reaction to begin with, and, and um, it, it may not be the, the severe thing, but it can be be very irritating. I used to get a rash around my my watch because we used um, we had latex gloves in, in the office. I loved latex gloves; they're so easy to get on, and then the, the, with the powder in them, that was just the Best, you know, with the, the sterile and the non sterile, we had the powder latex gloves. And they, I love the way they fit, I love the way they slide on, and it was just great. But um, I remember my wash and everything, I, I just get yeah, all broken out. So I wanted to have them wear a wash on my neck for a bit of time. And so it's not, not any 
of the floors that I've been on in our land, and the last several years have having latex gloves, or, or and we don't we stopped using powdered latex a long time ago because um, if people are allergic to latex and that powder goes off <coughs> the room and they breathe it in, I mean you could just a little bit can if somebody has a severe allergy could send them into the respiratory distress or respiratory failure. So it, it really can can end up being a very dangerous kind of thing. But but um, I think what I had was an allergy. I think it was just irritant. But, um, but that's that's certainly possibility. And I do have it on the notes page about um, the hypersensitivity reaction type 4. And that's, we're going to talk about that more in a minute. I think I did teach that. I'll go through It's really hard. And I don't understand all of it, but I just said, some folks are just far more about it. Dermatitis, though that's inflammation, not it's not the same mechanism. It's not um, it is not an allergic reaction. It, it is just a, um, a response to irritation, sort of like a um, mechanical or chemical um, kind of a thing. And anyway, like acid soaps detergent. Some things are more irritating to your skin than others. Just like um, like that alcohol-based hand sanitizer. If I use it that too long, that's one reason why I'm sitting on the pool. I wash my hands in the sink a lot of times. Um, but even that's so, you know, over and over and over again. But um, I, I do wash my hands in the, in the room a lot of times. If there's, if there's a sink there, rather than doing the two the phone in, phone out, phone in, phone out a million times, and it, it really it makes me have fissures in my fingers. And uh, so, so whenever I have a chance, I wash my hands in, um, with, the, with the soap and water instead of the water. So, it, so it's not the same irritant all the time. Um, anyway, um, the risk factors are whether you're susceptible to allergies, um, eczema, if you've got a moist environment, um, uh, burns, uh, certain plants, chemicals, metals, frequent hand washing, and that's, that's definitely one of them. Um, my daughter had um, some like, asthma-like symptoms, I think it's about, it's about a year ago. And she went to you know, going to the emergency room and she just really couldn't breathe and she had some exercise induced um, asthma when she was in the junior high school and doing a you know, big grade or something like that. And trying to run around the track and, and she did a short rest of the paper and the paper for the kids with her in the gym class. And then it was kind of it was just it kind of came and went this very mildly for, for a long time and didn't really have much trouble until for last year. And she really doesn't know what what um, set it off, but they did all the allergy testing where they do the little um, put the stuff on your back, put the antigens, a whole bunch of antigens in, on her back, and nothing reacted. I mean, nothing at all that they <coughs> tested her for. She was not allergic to any of it. But they said, you know, your your problem is not allergic; it's irritant, the the lung thing, and, and all that. It's not an allergy. So, so stuff like your tech and. Claritin, I'll then do a thing for her because it's, it's not a, it's not an allergic thing. And those are in his case. So, so you have to, have to treat the symptoms in another way. And then the, the uh, inhaler does it on the violation. Okay. Um, <coughs> allergic contact dermatitis. Um, we see irritant. And I shouldn't have put that on there. I just shouldn't have put that on there. Tell me what that means. Um, when, the uh, PETA class was, was studying this type of, of unit. They were, they were talking about um, like the Riva with wounds and everything where you got, you got redness, ecchymosis, edema, discharge, and approximation. Have y'all ever learned that before? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've told some of my clinical students that because we have a lot of surgical patients and everything, so I don't know if I, I don't want everybody to tell you that or not. But, but they, they were learning that, and it, it's so easy when you do the read, I think, to think of the, the, um, one of the E's is erythema. If you say redness and erythema, those are, those are the same thing, though. So when you're talking about read, it's redness and ecchymosis. So don't use the red 
blisters and the big blisters of bullet and then um, the irritant you can have area redness at the exposure location like I did with my, my gloves. Um, you can do patch testing for the allergies like what I was telling you about my, my, my daughter um, and if you spend almost 72 hours that might actually patch this. Do you have any questions? lotion, uh, oatmeal soaks and lukewarm baths and some, sometimes you can add um, things to the baths like cornstarch and special special oils and and um, um, what's the other thing? Oh, um, when you do have like eczema then sometimes they'll, the doctor will recommend like a cold tar um, shampoo. That's really, really um, irritant reducing Increase risk for, for some cancers, or they're they're looking into that. So it's not something you want to use every day. So you might want to use it intermittently if it helps you we have a flare up. And then of course, um, and his things do have um, they do relieve itching and all that. So you know, really, uh, just the reals, uh, and, um, and and then the, the, the newer generation. Benadryl, we just have to give Benadryl as a pre-med for some chemo, and um, and most people would go to sleep after you gave them like IV Benadryl, and um, they could have taken it in my mouth, but we we gave it IV, we knew they had it in them before we'd give them something that might cause an anaphylactic reaction, so we just didn't get IV, and they just kind of right out for a while. And um, but but some people ended up having like restless restless legs, and it can be the opposite in some people who really take them restless. therapeutic effect that you want. But now when you're needing to go to work and you take Benadryl right before you go to work, I mean, I, I can't take, even take Benadryl at night and get up in the morning and, and be clear-headed. It just, it really messes me up. I mean, it just is not, I can't get, get over it. Quick enough to go to work and drive and everything. So you got to be careful about the operating heavy machine and especially driving or doing something. Like, uh, sharp objects or sleep or cook or something like that. Vegetables or something. Then you, you can use the, um, the top of the lid 
if it's more than 10%, they usually do it oral um, of the body surface area. If it's 10% of the body surface area, they usually do oral for the steroid because it's more of a systemic kind of thing and it's hard to hard to cover that much of your body with one with creams. You can, but it's, it's difficult to do. So anyway, it just know that the um, the, the steroids do not cure inflammation. They they just help with the with the effects of it or the symptoms of it. So um, it, it uh, does relieve manifestations and it, it makes them more comfortable and all that kind of thing. But it does you know you have to really get the calls and avoid the, the uh, exposure. <coughs> and you don't want to use steroids in areas of infection. If you've got an infected one, even if it started as an inflammatory process, how do you want to use steroids or steroid creams? You have some of the to do just invite those organisms to grow and, and get worse. Now you do see, sometimes you'll see combination, like um, eye drops. I've had antibiotic and um, <coughs> steroid combination eye drops before. So I guess that that's one of those things that you're, you're, you're trying to, to weigh your risks and benefits because you need to decrease the inflammation because when inflammation really goes overboard, it can cause tissue damage, can it? So, so you want to get rid of the, the um, irritation and inflammation, but at the same time, you don't want to infect it if it is an infection <coughs> resulting from the inflammation. And you uh, need to treat other things, and I'm not sure you're going to see that. Um, so <coughs> many have, how many people have had patients with COPD so far? And were they mostly on steroids? But sometimes they had pneumonia at the same time, and, they, and, and so you're, you're trying to actually weigh that out. <coughs> Inflammation is so severe in COPD a lot of times when they have those exacerbations that the inflammation is damaging to their to their breathing. And our ABC, you know, we're, if we're trying to um, enhance the, the breathing um, process, we want to make sure that, that uh, we decrease that inflammation along with treating the infection. So sometimes you'll send these together. You know, it seems like it's, that it shouldn't be, but that it's, it's not your choice, but sometimes you just have to do it. With the that looks like the bikini thing or maybe a diaper, yeah. that could have been a diaper. But what what else could it be if they were wearing a little bikini or a, or a little speedo or something and you you uh, washed it in the new detergent or something? Like that. I mean we don't really know. It didn't didn't say where the picture was. Yeah, it kind of looks like a, a diapery line, but but I don't know. It could it could be. Um, some kind of soap or, or something like that too. Hard, hard tail, but anyway, um, we want to uh, teach people what, what they do to care for themselves. Um, uh, if you've got something really itchy, you don't want to expose them a lot of heat, do you? When you really itch, don't you want to have it cool? And if it's really, really hot, but you've got some, some itchy rash or whatever, you want to get in a cool air conditioned area or, or even maybe put it some cool home. Okay. Um, oh, one of the things about the applying the steroids is that if you can apply it thinly to damp skin, I've heard that for any kind of lotion though, if you've really got dry skin, that, it, that it, the lotion and the emollient effects of the lotion works better. Um, it absorbs better if you're um, if you're just if you've just come out of the, the bathtub or your, your skin is damp and, and you get the lotion on and then it works the same way that the you know, steroid uh, preparations absorb better if your skin is damp um, and you don't want to be real hot or anything but you uh, may not take a real hot bath so you still be um, and then when you do oral uh, for your steroids a lot of times when um, dermatitis and irritations they 
lazy, um, if, you're, if you're taking the artificial forms of, of cortisone, like our adrenal gland, what do you make? The adrenal gland just kind of kicks back and puts its feet up and says, I don't have to do anything about the body's got stuff is stuck in here. I'm not going to make it. You know, you need to do that kind of thing. So, so the, the just gets lazy. And then if you just drink those food or delay immediately, if there's a, a lag time before the adrenal gland gets back in and start to do some cortisone, end up with some really, really bad uh, effects, especially with like exhaustion and manipulative you know, fatigue, worse than that. But it's, it can really make you feel bad. It's not a, um, not something you need to stop abruptly, especially if it's been a fairly long term of um, oral corticosteroids. Um, we want to avoid alcohol if we're taking antihistamines, and we don't want to drive or operate machinery when, when drowsy. And we also, with Benadryl and Bistril and things like that, we got to be careful about what, what urinary problem possibly. Attention. Attention, yeah. Um, and um, I'll let y'all just re read over this and, and the, um, the the person process assessment and plan and implement, implementation and all that sort of thing. But um, I had done a, another slide here on, this is really mm. horrible, isn't it? This was done from another, another country, but it, it, it gave the description that, that this little boy had, um, I think it was, let's see, it was the, the equivalent of, of acetaminophen, Tylenol, and he had amoxicillin, and he had um, a decongestant as well. And they don't really even know if it was a drug induced because some, some infections, some bacterial infections can actually elicit the Stephen Johnson syndrome too. So they didn't really know for sure whether the drugs did it or whether the, the re he had a fever and all. He came in with a fever and got those medications. And so it, it might have been the infection that caused the Stephen Johnson. They just don't, don't really know. But it, it, you see how it's affecting his, you know, his eyes, his mouth, his nose. So the mucous membranes are affected and it's just just really um, all over his body. So, um, and the, the reason I put this here, and I, I ha asked you to read that part in Iggy, is that, that there's so many times I had several people when we were going over meds talking about the Stevens Johnson syndrome. It's usually in red because it's really, really serious. And, and you can see why it would be serious. It looks like it's been burned all over his body or something. Yeah, and that's, a, that's a real risk to treat the infection adequately if the antibiotic that, that's best for that particular infection um, uh, is, is just aggravating and or, or causing the problem. So, it, I mean, it can really be a, uh, a, a very difficult situation. So, uh, and it can, can be life threatening. So, just wanted to, to, um, to see some pictures like that. And it is, there's a real good picture of an adult male that has the, um, the, the he's got places on his back that is peeled off. The, um, and it's just open and oozy tissue on, on his back. And it's a lot like that, too. You can see the mucous membranes on the, the, um, the guy in the book. But, but that, that, I think that's a really good thing for y'all to, to see. Um, you know, the, the put, put a face on it rather than it just be in this red print in the book. You know? I think that, that can help him. All right. I think this is all the they're kind of your sentinels of the immune system or the white blood cells. And um, when you see that on your lab, I think at row in it says P, 
PMN. Isn't that right, Jeff? That was what you were asking about. The PM, PMN polymorph nucleosides. Yes, and and so if you see that at, at low end, that's where that's the neutrophils. Um, and I, I wish they didn't abbreviate it. I wish they they'd say what it is at first and then then use abbreviation. But but anyway, um, uh, the their the mature neutrophil and all that is talking about is going right on into the to the injury. I think that's kind of kind of <coughs> interesting um, picture. You can find all kinds of stuff when you, when you Google, but I don't think there's anything on that particular um, notes page. And then, so we're going to talk about one healing. That's that's an exemplar too. I didn't say exemplar, but that's one of the things we're supposed to be talking about. The wound healing can also be called wound generation. But what we're um, going to mention first on the notes page here is primary intention healing, and that is something you, you do need to know what the primary and secondary and tertiary intention means. Um, and it's also called primary union or first intention healing. You might see that in other sources sometimes. But that means um, approximated, and if you haven't had to read this yet, yeah, approximated means that the edges of a wound are coming together. So, if a pressure ulcer, would it be, if you've got a, like a stage four pressure ulcer, would that be approximated? No, no. no. The edges would certainly not be better on that, would it? So, so the, um, this is like a, a closed surgical incision with sutures or staples, or it can't even be like nerve bond that tissue adhesive. So, um, and, it, and it does have a lot less scarring when it heals this way, um, and you don't have um, much tissue loss in it. And, okay, this is just a picture of a well approximated surgical incision. So that looks like that the woman had lung surgery, got it, and then had a drain as well. So the, the incisions were, uh, and or chest tube, that was chest tube, that was chest tube sutures. So the, the um, patient may have had two chest tubes and then had, had the, the surgical incision um, as well. So that's a, that's a huge incision in a very sensitive part of the body, but it isn't approximated, and so are these little. Um, smaller ones. So it is closed and the edges are together. And so here it is, I got this from the Dermabond um, website. And I, you could see it easier on your computer, I guess. But this is like during the surgery, the wound's coated with the Dermabond right here. And uh, there is a, a drain, there's a puncture wound and all with the, with the drain. And this is a Jackson Pratt drain. So my, how many of y'all had Jackson Pratt so far? You'll say we have, we've had a, a number of people already get to work with that. I'll pass some of those around um, when we're, we're doing our lab next week. I don't know what else I was supposed to tell you. Somebody was asking me yesterday what we were doing after Amanda was doing her thing on, on Thursday, tomorrow. And I was thinking that we were going to practice with dressings because we did it like that last year, but, but I changed my mind that um, we're going to do the dressing practice next week, next Thursday. So whoever that was, I can't remember who I told that to, but we are going to um, do some more content after, after Amanda's class, especially if you have questions about things, and we can do some of our content on pressure ulcers. One reason why I'm skipping around from what the book does now is that Amanda's going to cover a lot of the, the pressure ulcer content, probably more than you ever could have from your book. But, um, but we'll, we may fill in some of that after um, after she has done her presentation and maybe clarify some things according to definitions that your that your book uses or whatever. Um, but that's probably what we'll we'll do um, mainly Monday, uh, this coming Monday before we go to, to clinical prep. But um, I, I just want to make sure that that y'all knew we, we were just going to do we're going to do work on the continue this this content and everything tomorrow. Um, but let's see, what else was I going to say? Well, anyway, the, this this came. I I really did all of this um, specifically from the website and everything. Gave them credit for for where I got it and all this thing. But I, I think that's this is a really really good good picture of that. And I usually do um, send around a, um, a hema back and and a Jackson Pratt drain, and everybody likes to squeeze it because it, it whistles and makes a, a certain little tone, and it's really fun. I guess just like y'all all learned about the medicine cups, and everybody was click click clicking it. And y'all were walking by the, that one group in the way I was walking by the, because Norris is always, always in there talking to her and the dean. And then y'all couldn't see that the dean was in there. But all this click, 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 and going down all the way. Um, everyone's like, what is that? Um, 
Um, before Lauren Marley was saying that, Lauren Marley was saying, what the hell is that saying? I said, that's our exemplary nursing. Anyway, but this, this, um, <coughs> the, uh, if, if you're just playing with the um, uh, not used, um, you know, if it's in a patient, it's not going to make a little whistle, but it, it does make a little cute whistle, so y'all probably enjoy that, um, unless somebody's broken it. But this does make a, um, a, a, a microbial shield that really, it does approximate it, and it doesn't even have the trauma of the, the staples and and, or the sutures, because I mean, that's a traumatic wound. That's an intentional wound, too, isn't it? Suturing and stapling is an, an you know, that's intentional uh, break in, in, um, in the skin integrity also. So anyway, that's, that's, you can always go to the website. I just thought that was a cool picture. All right, and this, the state, and I'm not talking about pressure ulcers in general, but it is actually an example of the of second intention healing, secondary intention there with a lot of tissue loss, isn't there? And the edges can't be closed um, like they are now. Secondary. There's, not, there's not enough tissue to bring together, is there? There's not enough tissue. Secondary intention healing. You notice that the heart. It takes a lot longer to heal. Um, scarring is a whole lot greater, and the susceptibility to infections is a lot greater. And of course, blood pressure ulcers, the, the prime example of that. It doesn't have to be stage four to be um, secondary either, necessarily. This next one's really gross. Too, that, doesn't look, that doesn't look good either, but um, this was, um, um, it, it's going to be closed by, after partial healing, by secondary intention. It, it, it healed, it's, it's healed up partially, um, and it is nice and pink, and, and it looks like it's well perfused, doesn't it? Because it, it's nice and red or, or pink. So this is, um, when, when a wound has healed by secondary intention, and then it, it gets repaired by, um, by suturing or stables or adhesive, um, or whatever kind of thing, um, then, then that is called tertiary. cleaning out the, the dead tissue and leaving the granulation tissue, the healthy that it is being um, perfused well. Um, and you know, women in ostomy incontinence nurses that are certified, they, they are um, able to, I guess it's really what stage you're in, or the nursing's um, rules and that's the Nursing Practice Act um, in, in the state. But, educated and trained to, to do that, that just a procedure to, to be able to make that judgment as to which tissue needs to be, be clipped away or which, which tissue needs to, to stay. I can't tell what it is. It's a little bit of a It looks like what? An amputated leg. Yeah, that's what it looks like to me. I think that's what it is. It's an amputation. That's, it's a, it looks like a stump, like a above the knee amputation. Is that what y'all think? I mean, it doesn't, doesn't say, but that's what it looks like. Looks like me. Um, but anyway, we have to make sure that there's not a edema because if you try to suture something that's edematous, it's going to be very strong tissue. Well, there's mm -hmm. a there's mm -hmm. a there's 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 a 
and you can really kind of kind of tell they made this sort of poochy. And then then um, we've got here's the wound itself, where the uh, there's uh, clotting and the, the wound sort of seals like a, a scab. Then the neutrophils the neutrophils come in first, but then they when when there's a job to be done and it's really a big job and the neutrophils can't take care of all of it, then those monocytes come in. They they are phagocytes. The neutrophils are phagocytes too. What's phagocyte mean? Yeah. It just engulfs, doesn't it? You're doing, you're doing like the Pac-Man thing, aren't you? That's the way I always That's look at neutrophils and phagocytes is, is Pac-Man. I don't know if anybody even knows what Pac-Man is anymore. That's, that's an old, old, old school, isn't it? That's, that was like the first video game and then something like that, the Pac-Man. But they, they would go around and, and eat things up. But, but the phagocytes actually engulf it and, and eat it. I have a really good... good uh, thing on YouTube, but I'm still on there and I can show you what we do in Unity that this shows baby sites just engulfing and eating up stuff. I think it's actually a um, computer generated thing that's really cool. And then we've got in, increased capillary permeability and actually a lot of times they're new blood vessels and they call it angiogenesis. Genesis means like creation, doesn't it? So and angio means blood vessel, so angiogenesis is creation of new a new blood supply. Um, a lot of times that the, the, the monocytes will, will um, call in the, the troops to, to start up some, some new little buds of, of blood vessels as well to, to be able to, to oxygenate the tissue better to, to uh, increase the healing. So um, this inflammatory phase is our, is our first phase, of course, and it, um, it lasts about three to six days, but that can certainly vary. That just depends on the, um, you know, whether you've got infection or or how well nourished you are, and there's just lots of, lots of things that can affect this. And then the hemostasis is where you see that uh, clotting in the wound ceiling there on the top. It's like, like red plastic on it. Um, and, but that, it, it starts with um, constrictive blood vessels to help de decrease the, the bleeding. Um, and they, they sort of retract and draw back so that you don't exsanguinate. That's, a, that's an awful word, but with that exsanguinate means you, you just would bleed to death and if you uh, have a tremendous amount of bleeding. And then fibrin is part of the, the clotting factors that's released to, to um, allow this uh, cell repair and the scab to form. Um, and then some of the, the dead tissue is sort of on the skin surface can be part of that scab as well. But it all it just adds to sort of the mesh of the network that, that uh, allows it to close up a little bit. And then the failure psychosis is essential to the human being that really needs to be destroyed. Because if you have a cut um, from like a barbed wire or something like that, um, or, or if it's a, um, a stab or a bullet wound or something like that, um, that's not, it's going into a sterile, it's supposed to be a sterile area, isn't it? And it goes deep into the tissues. And so, so um, the phagocytosis definitely needs to, to get, get rid of any of the um, germs that are entering into a place that they're not supposed to be. A skin surface has lots of germs, and that's natural and, and normal and, and helpful to us. But, um, but when, it's, when it's way down deep in the tissue, that's not normal. Okay, and um, the neutrophils go into that interstitial space and uh, into the outside of the blood vessel. You want to see that very first picture, the one out of the blood, the blood stream and into the tissue. And then um, about 24 hours later, if they're still working, they can be and they engulf and they can be lots and lots of microorganisms. They're bigger than the, the neutrophils. They're, they're big, big bad guys. Um, as far as they're, they're good guys, but they're just sort of like bouncers in a bar or something. Like that. They're, they're not kicking anybody out that's not supposed to be there. And then this is where I, I got on there about that angiogenesis factor. It's secreted by the macrophages to stimulate the blood vessel formation and increase the circulation and all that with the perfusion. And then, um, again, the anti-inflammatory, we've got that inf inflammation going on that is supposed to be helping the body, and then you give... Um, anti-inflammatory medications, or maybe the patient has to have anti-inflammatory meds because they're having an exacerbation of COPD, <coughs> but then they get injured or, or have to have surgery, and then you know, that's a dangerous situation for them to be in that. But a lot of people, a lot of patients in the hospital have a situation where they're on anti-inflammatory and they're trying to heal well. And then the other thing that we need Okay, and then we've got the reconstruction phase. 
Heights, um, where we're getting some new, well, this is actually definitely repaired epithelial cells and everything because it, it's still got that scab and then we still got some deeper tissue injury, but we've got some, got these skin cells that are regenerating and, and then there's there's collagen being produced in here and, and uh, fibroblasts are migrating in and out and there's capillary budding, so angiogenesis has, has really taken place and, and it's got, got a nice uh, blood supply. So this lasts from um, three to four days and it, um, until day, day 21. So that's about three weeks that it takes. And it's um, reconstruction of what proliferative. And you can see that their, their skin cells proliferate and their blood vessels proliferate. So that, that, um, that, that word is being used. Um, and then the, the, the collagen is added straight to the skin so that it will stay here. And the granulation tissue is the, is the little pink looking uh, tissue that that's why it looks real pink. And it can bleed real easily though because it is it does have such a good blood supply. And then so the, the tissue's real real red and, and uh, or, or very pink uh, because of that, the capillaries being so close to the surface and, and that extra blood supply. And um, if if this epithelialization doesn't happen, then the scab just gets gets bigger and bigger and just adds more and more and more um, of the, the dead cells and, and um, sort of old old blood. That um, SCAR, E-C-H-A-R, that's on that thing with that, that's that, it's real black and kind of nasty looking sometimes. But um, it is dry plastic proteins and dead cells and, and uh, eventually convert to the dead scar tissue. And, uh, that is something that, that uh, <coughs> I think America covers more. I don't have to say much else about that. And we'll go we'll, um, from, from there. Let's go ahead and take another 10 minute break. So I've got, I've got a lot of contracts and it, and it gets the, the scar gets smaller and then less if you will um, And that's, that's when it can um, add more on our ecology is laid down. And that's it's called hypertrophic scar. <coughs> Break down. It can be, you know, it can be for a third element. Yes, yes, so it can be um, overgrowth of the scar tissue. Yes, and that's what people are. And it seems to be more common in, in people with darker skin for some reason. Maybe, I don't know, has anything to do with those? But that's the story. And besides, I have no idea. They didn't really explain that part of it. But um, some people call those keloid crown tissue. Have you ever heard of that before? Injury, and then the scar does become stronger and stronger and stronger, but it's never as strong as the original tissue was, though. So that that area, um, wherever you, you had an injury and a, a scar formation, even if you got a got a big old keloid there, it's still not as strong as what your original tissue was before the injury. So so that's that's a point to really really uh, remember that uh, you'd rather not have to have the the, uh, the injury or the, the problem with the skin integrity, but, but if, if you do, this is what happens, and then that, that's the, um, as good as it gets. So, I'm going to see if I can get this little thing to play right. This is up in the movie, I'm going to the other one. It's really short. Well, the overlapping phases, inflammation, proliferation, and maturation and remodeling. The inflammatory phase controls bleeding, combats infectious agents that may be present, and attracts cells vital for repair to the zone of injury. The macrophage is vital to this phase of healing. Inflammation is characterized by localized redness, heat, swelling, pain, and decreased function. The proliferative phase involves angiogenesis, granulation, tissue formation, wound contraction, and epithelialization. The maturation and remodeling phase reorganizes and increases the strength of the scar tissue up to two years after wound closure. Wound closure may be, one, primary, where the wound edges are approximated, two, 
secondary, where the wound defect must first be filled with granulation tissue, or three, delayed primary closure, a combination of the two. Abnormal wound healing is slower than expected, or characterized by changes in the typical characteristics of each phase of wound healing. Clinicians must be able to identify both normal and abnormal wound healing characteristics to effectively manage patients with open wounds. Gentlemen's older because they got that bedside chart and all that. Don't do that much anymore, do we? But anyway, that's that's that one. Um, well, you, well, you know, I have several of these little ones. Would y'all be interested in me putting posts in that? I mean, you don't have to. It, it really is saying the same kind of thing. But did, would y'all like me to post those at all? I mean, would that help? At least one of them. And you don't have to memorize it because I think it's really saying the same, basically the same thing. But if you come and see it in motion, it kind of Makes more sense. I'll, I'll post the, the video thing. And, uh, I won't do it until after we've seen it in class, though, just so you'll have a, a heads up already. Okay, I guess I better get my slide here. Okay. Exudate. That seems kind of like a gross word, doesn't it? <laughs> Exudative. But it, it, it can really be a good thing. And, and uh, this is our fluids and dead phagocytes, the macrophages and neutrophils that have been that have died in, in the line of duty and that they get have gotten out of the blood vessels during the inflammatory process and they, they never go back in there. They they die right in on the battlefield and then they but they become part of the exudate. So it can actually be retained in the tissue or it can come come to the tissue surface and, and um, act as drainage or it can be like in a wound drain like a like a hemovac or a, um, a Jackson Pratt drain or, or any other kind of drain and um, it does depend on what tissues being is involved in like how much glandular tissue there is too whether there, there's um, a lot of potential for secretion in that particular area and then how, how long the, the inflammation has been going on and whether there's organisms in it or what kind of organisms are in it, it, it really does make a difference. And there's there's three t um, types. There's serous and purulent and sanguinous, which is hemorrhagic or is blood, basically. But I'm going to give you some examples of, of these. Um, and you can probably see this a lot better on your computer, but this is this probably... This is a blister, and mm -hmm. I, I bet you, Adam, I bet this is a bullet. <laughs> that, that's really taking up a whole bunch. It's that blister is like taking up a, the, a huge surface on that little baby's um, ankle area. So, so they probably say that's a bullet, but you know, if you call it a vesicle. That's not really wrong. But, but um, serous fluid is like blister fluid, where it's really pretty, pretty much clear, mostly serum, watery like. It, it has some cells in it, but it's not enough to be really, really cloudy or doesn't have like white blood cells um, in great numbers in it to make it look like pus. So, okay. And it, this may look better on your computer screen. It did, it did on mine last mm -hmm. night. But this, this is like a, uh, an eye infection and it's just, it's really, that's just really gross looking. But, but it's, it's real uh, liquidy kind of thing. A lot of times when you've got pink eye, it just, your, your eye just gets um, mad and shut, and I guess if, if that's just why, because you're, you're um, sleeping and it doesn't, um, it isn't able to escape and all, it just just dries out. But but this is this is real, um, it's thick, but it's still it's real moist and, and wet. But so that's definitely a conjunctivitis kind of thing. It, it looks like um, it's definitely the this exudate and purulent exudate is is pus. So when you talk about purulent, that means you've got a pussy discharge. And then um, it's, it's thicker, and it's got white blood cells in the in dead tissue debris, and um, it's got dead and living bacteria in it. Um, so that's that's where you got to be really, really careful. Um, and sometimes when you've got infected exudative wounds or, or conditions like that, then you might put people in isolation depending on what the organism is and, and all that um, too, because that could be, you know how contagious pink eye is, and, those of you who know, have kids, if, if there's anybody at school with pink eye, they let all the parents know and say that, you know, make sure that your kids washing their hands and not rubbing their eyes and all that kind of thing because it really goes through families and it goes through classrooms and schoolyards and all that sort of thing. 
So when when pus is forming, it's the process of, of pus formation is called suppuration. S U P P U R A T I O N. It's on your notes page, but that's it. And when bacteria do produce pus, they it is called pyogenic bacteria. So pyo has to do with pus also. Purulent and pyo, pyogenic is um, uh, uh, producing uh, pus. And that you usually think of pus as being yellow, but with some organisms, it could be even um, even greenish or bluish. So, um, what bacteria causes uh, the greenish, or that you kind of associate? Do some of y'all work in healthcare know what one time out with the green? Like Pseudomonas, have y'all heard of Pseudomonas before? Have you seen? Have, have y'all seen? Have y'all seen green pus before? Or sometimes it's yellowish green and all that. See, the moments is usually like associated with the green. Um, so again, if it's mixed with other other kind of organisms, it might might be a different color. But. Okay, these are these are kind of gross. I'm sorry about all that, but I, I was trying to get examples of all this. But this here's the egg, the the um, hemorrhagic exudate, the sanguinous. So um, y'all know what. Um, what the word is for for blood in French? Sangue. It's right there, and the S A N G S A is is blood, or has to do with blood. That and that may be a Latin derivative. I don't know. I didn't take Latin, but I took French all the time. But um, uh, it, 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 when you see sang like that, that's another the clue that you've got blood. Um, you're, you're referring to blood. Sang what is actually um, it, and it has large number of red blood cells. Obviously, you can you can t see that. Um, and so you've got s severe capillary damage when you've got bleeding like this, and open wounds are, are like that, of course, and, until the until that process, the inflammatory process, and the fibrin and the um, uh, putting down the network to to um, with the platelets and everything to to close up the wound, and um, so it's bright red, fresh fresh blood. And if you have if you have dark red oozing out, um, that that's maybe an um, older damage. It may be coming out of the tissue, but it's not. It isn't as, as fresh. But what what colors blood inside your veins if there's no tissue integrity problem? Blue. It's blue, red, now. Because uh, well, if you if you look, well, look at me. Look at my. Um, Okay, my, you can see through my skin here. I'm translucent here. So it's blue, isn't it? Happy about that. Mm -hmm. So it's not why blue. does it turn? Why would, if I cut myself, why is it oxygen. red when it's oxygen? oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. It's oxygen. Yeah, the oxygen from the air hits it, and so it's red. Yeah, but it's kind of weird to think about that. Would you say I was oxygenated inside? What's that? I always thought that was a myth that it was blue because your blood's oxygenated inside. Yeah, then it carries the sugar in our well, yeah, but, it, but it's, been, it's been pumped from the, the heart. The oxygen leaves once it goes to back the to the heart. And, and then so back the to the left side of the heart. heart. And see, mine has already been down to my fingers, <laughs> and Thank these veins are taking it back because the, the oxygen's been exchanged in, in my tissues all the way down to the, the peripheral areas. <laughs> and then it's going, it's going so back, it's back, right. back up, and it, it is blue. It actually is blue on the inside. Um, but but now once once you expose the oxygen, the oxygen's what makes it red. So. You do, it is red when it comes out of the heart. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. absolutely. Or the arterial blood it's should be red. The organs and the organs that depleted the oxygen when it right. goes back to the heart is blue. But the venous blood, especially in the periphery, when it's gone all the way down there, by the time it's gotten rid of the, all the oxygen that it had, it's 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 going to be be blue. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, when there's no oxygen, yeah, even there, that's right. Your lips turn blue. That means lack of oxygen. You're right. That's what we're talking about with the cyanosis and everything. Yeah, and and when you're looking at nail beds, my nail beds are pink. But if, if they were if they were blue, then then that would mean what? No oxygen. Lack of oxygen. Yeah, because um, the, the oxygen has exchanged in the blood that's. Um, back to where the heart to get more is, is blue. It's done its job and it's got to got to get reoxygenated. And why do they not have? Why do they make you take your fingernail polish off before you go to the? Because you can't. Because it'll 
know, so that's what you look for the oxygen. Yeah, you want to just do this, have that nail bed deal. And of course, you could do it at the, on the fingertips too, but like the capillary refill on your fingertips even. But but you, you if you can look in the, the nail beds, that's that's a really good good place to to look. And it's it's really scary sometimes. People come into hospital with blue nail polish on, and it can really scare you sometimes if you're just if they're appearing distressed or, or something like that and, and you, you go and look at their those blue nails. Oh my gosh, and it glitters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So don't don't wear blue nail polish in, in it, um, to the hospital. You'll get everybody confused. Okay, this is a gross one now. Another gross one, I guess. This is a wound drain and it's got just all this pus in it. I mean, so that, that's really gross. This is an infected sebaceous cyst. What's sebaceous cyst? Sebaceous cyst. It's an oil gland, isn't it? Right. It's like an oil type of, of um, cyst. So, um, and and those can be, um, uh, they, they can make a whole lot of like like fatty discharge and everything in, inside and and, um, and it can be just a clo closed in cyst, but sometimes they can get infected and then, then it's really a, a mess. And have you heard of pilonidal cyst? Like at the, at the base of the spine sometimes, like a, um, a hair follicle will get infected. And I guess since we sit so much and it gets sweaty and it's in the skin fold right at the where the buttocks start and everything, that's a the pilonidal cyst can be really nasty like that. That's, that's kind of how it is. It, it's just a real... Um, the cyst, as long as it's enclosed, that's fine. But if it, if the integrity of it gets broken and it gets infected, then it's it's, it's sort of like that. I'm not sure where that one is. It doesn't really say. No, so. But anyway, that this is um, mixed exudate is what we're talking about. Serosanguinous. Um, it, it can have some some blood in it. Um, blood and serum, and so it may look sort of pinkish instead of. Um, instead of being bright red, but that you, you can see that it's got some, some blood in it. So it can be clear and blood tinged in it. It's, a, a, it's like that a lot with surgical incisions, is the serosanguinous. And then the purosanguinous would be what? Pus. Pus and blood in that. That's more like what was in there. You can't really see the blood in that, but it has some old blood coming out with, with the pus. And that's what I'm, I'm seeing anyway, I'm, and how, that's how I interpreted it. But um, it, it can be a, the, a new wound that's infected where you, you have some, some bleeding as well. And that one's older blood. Um, but if it's bright red and, and um, pus too, then that's a newer wound because it's, um, um, it's a fresher one with the red. Okay, um, our complications of wound healing, these are, these are really, really important. Hemorrhage is definitely one. What's hemorrhage mean? Bleeding. Oh, yeah. 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 Hemorrhage is a, is a life-threatening thing if it's a, a lot of blood loss. And then in an emergency um, situation, you have to pop uh, pressure dressing and, and monitor the vital signs. Um, or, you, you know, with that, that uh, Boston Marathon bombing and all that kind of thing, people were just all over the place applying pressure with belts and scarves and not... Um, I don't know, bras or whatever. I'm not sure what all they use, but you know, whatever you got, you just have to. to you don't. A, a lot of times, you're not. You don't want to do a, um, a tourniquet if if you've got some viable tissue beyond that point because you could actually cut off the circulation to where they're gonna. They would lose that limb, but um, if if it's just you know dangling or something, you're really gonna have to put a um, you know, some kind of tourniquet or whatever on. But but definitely we have to apply pressure and elevate the if it is a limb elevated um, higher than the heart, 
And then, um, of course, why would we monitor the vital signs? I mean, what, what would we be looking for that we would not? Hypotension, yes, yes. And, and what else? What about pulse? Tachycardia. Uh, Tachycardia. Well, what would it be? Which is tacky or brady? Tacky. It, it is tacky um, most of the time because because your your heart's trying to to perfuse. It's trying to compensate and perfuse. So um, that normally you would see some if you're if you've got a lot of blood loss, you'd see some tachycardia. Um, and let's see infection, and that that can set in between two and eleven days post op or, or even after that if you're picking at something that shouldn't be picked at or whatever. But um, when you've got an infection, though, that really can interfere with healing, and the organisms have to compete with with the um, the new cells for the oxygen and, and nutrition. And the organisms went out sometimes, so that means that your um, your your healing tissue, that granulation tissue, is not going to get all the blood supply that it needs and all the oxygen that it needs, and um, the, that impairs the wound healing. And and um, you need to look for the change, any change in the color or pain or drainage. Um, between those especially two to eleven days and you know what the infection is if you do a wound culture and, and see see what the organism is but if there's purulent drainage you probably you're pretty much gonna assume that it is a um, an infected one and then the um, immunosuppressed patients are at greatest risk people that have AIDS or people that are taking cancer treatment or people that have had a um, a good organ transplant and they're taking prednisone or somebody that's got COPD that's an exacerbation and they're having to take your, their, like we said a while ago, take the steroids to be able to breathe and, and uh, if they can't breathe then, you know, the, the infection's not the biggest issue. If you can't breathe you're not going not gonna to perfuse anything. So um, so that's that's pretty that's pretty scary. But um, I'm also going to mention too um, with this timing and all that, my, my um, husband had has lots of, he was born with lots of moles, and so he goes to the dermatologist every year for skin check, and, and they usually get some things taken off. He has these kind of large black, and some of them have been just plastic as when they've been, they've taken them off. But um, he had one taken off sort of a, a shoulder. He had several taken off, but, but one, one day he, he came home, and I was supposed to be putting a, putting an antibiotic um, ointment on it in a, a new Band-Aid, and, and it was just really, like, bluish looking instead of, you know, you expect it maybe to be a little a little pink around it or something like that, but it just, it looked just dark, like, and, it, and like it, it wasn't getting as much oxygen or something. But, but he's like, no, I, I was, uh, he, he does heat and air conditioning. He has to do some, has to go in the houses and the crawl spaces to see the, the floor floats and all that kind of stuff. And he had gone under a house and he still had sutures in this, this wound. And, um, and so he, you know, he's under the house and, made, you know, having to move his shoulders around and all that. And he said, I'm sure that's why it looks different. And, yeah, you know, it feels a little touchy, but I, I think it's just because I, you know, use my shoulders so much and I probably, you know, kind of strained it or whatever. And I'm like, well, okay. And that was a stupid thing to do when I'm a nurse. And I said, well, okay, we saw a change that didn't look good. And I, I, I just let him talk me into that it was okay. Well, it, it really was infected. And, and he, he still has a... We had to come go to the doctor and get the antibiotics, of course, too. But but it didn't. It, it took it much longer to heal than, than his other incisions. He had I think two other ones taken off too. I mean, it was just like a, a not even an inch long incision. But but um, they um, they did give him antibiotics. But it it still has like a like a dip in it where it just did not you know come together as as well. And the like that basement membrane of the epithelial cells there was supposed to in the collagen and all that didn't fill in like it like it did in the other areas and, and if you hadn't a, we'd have gotten we'd have um, gotten to it a day or so earlier it probably wouldn't have wouldn't have done that. I mean it's not like it's any huge deal but it's like that that really told me something that I better just go with my <laughs> don't don't believe somebody that, that doesn't know what you're supposed to assess but that's that was the whole thing. It was hurting and the color was messed up. We didn't have drainage yet but you know those two things I didn't I didn't get on it quick enough, and I, I feel like a really terrible nurse. And this was just like two years ago, so it's like, ah, sometimes we, we get get fooled. Okay, um, on the notes page, this is really, really, really important about these two words. And you're going to get this again with this Walker. I guess she's going to still teach OR. I'm not sure she did. I don't think there's any argument about that unless something. 
Yes, it happens, but um, yeah, she, she does the OR quarantine. I know Perry Hawkins and the three doctors are going to use all the food and the last number of the post office. So, one of the things that you do need to know this for women, too, though, and at deep distance, that's, that's a, you know, just like the word too, isn't it? But it's when the, the wound actually ruptures, and it, it's a surgical wound, and it ruptures, it opens up. And it's usually in the abdomen, but it could it could be somewhere else too, especially if um if somebody if they suture like um, edematous tissue together in the arm or something in your huge arm and you break loose. I mean that that's possible, but usually you think of the distance in the abdomen. And it can be about four to five days after the, the surgery before the collagen has really um, filled in and, and made the, the room stronger. Even though if it, it's approximated at that particular time, it can come, come loose if, it, if there's a particular strain on it. Um, and then, another bad word is the visceration. What's visceration? These organs, right? Visceration, these are guts, basically. And so, um, and that's where it's going to have to be better through an incision. Um, so, the organ protrudes through an incision. So sudden straining, like coughing or sneezing, um, and that's the same kind of thing like, like stress urinary incontinence, isn't it? And you're, you know, here, if you do a sudden straining, um, the cough, sneeze, laugh, laughing hard, whatever, and you're not splinting that the abdominal wound, especially people if, they, if they've been a dematist or if they're obese and, and all that, that, that can set them up for uh, at least more likelihood of a risk for um, dehiscence or, or evisceration. And so constipation is, you now sometimes we think about if we're, we're um, assessing our patient for you know, when, when was your last bowel movement or that sort of thing, and we're thinking, well, that's not an ABC thing, blah, 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 blah. But, but that could be a really, really big deal for somebody that's got a, they're diabetic and they're immunosuppressed and they're, um, they're on steroids for the so they can breathe and all those kind of things. You've got multiple risk factors there, and then they're straining. Especially with holding the breath and bearing down, that that really makes it. Um, you know, it can cause that bradycardia and all that too. But it it can make it more um, more difficult with the um, risk for the dehiscence and the visceration as well. And this was actually in that little. This picture was in that that little movie because it, it was a. Um, Can y'all use pillows to splint Pillow. abdominal wounds and, and all that? So we were just saying that. <laughs> 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 yeah, but, but, um, 
so <coughs> to make them do their, their coughing and deep breathing exercises, you want them to, want them to do because they, don't, they may not feel like breathing deeply. And but then, then that's an ABC thing. I, I want y'all to remember these interventions that you do and put it on your concept map that you have the patients swim their wound um, so that they would, could do their breathing exercises. <laughs> because it hurts their incision, then you can help them splint their incision while they're doing their incisions. And it's in the spirometer. And that's really, really, really important stuff. You know, if you, if you look at the implications of it as a nurse versus a, you know, a, a, a CNA, then, um, then you can see how important those things are. And, and mention it, because I know y'all do those kind of things every day, and I bet you don't put it on your concept map, but they do, because you need credit for that. Okay, and this is that, what's the cecum? and evisceration, either one, the client can say, I feel like I'm coming apart. Well, just like the zipper, you know, you're just kind of pulling, you're pulling the, um, the parts apart like that when you, when you unzip your tight jeans and it's like, <laughs> But um, anyway, um, I'm coming apart or if they feel like, you know, that, that there's a problem, you really need to assess and, and, uh, and uh, look and see what's going on. And if it if there um, if it does happen, you need to put <coughs> in sterile saline and, and sterile gauze and put put over um, the wound. But you need to put put them in the bed with their with the knees bent, so we won't put pressure on the, the incision or, or in the the, um, the area. You don't want to have um, have pressure um, on there. So if they got their, their knees bent, um, then that that will keep it. From, from getting worse. And so this is one of those like test question things that I, I've seen on having to do with this. It's like, so so what would you do first? It really kind of depends on where they are and what they're doing, isn't it? Because if, what if they're on the toilet? What if they're walking in the hall and they're, then they have, they cough and they come, you know, everything comes apart. So how, you don't really, it depends on where they are, doesn't it? Because you can't, you can't necessarily do all of those things at once, but it, all of those things are, pretty much equally important, but it really depends. They all have to be done. If you can get some help, that's that's what you, you probably need to do. So you can do all those three things at once. Go get, you, you help the patient, um, get a physician, get somebody else to go get the, the sterile um, gauze and the, and the sterile um, saline, and get somebody else to call the doctor you know, the, um, and, and um, notify them what's going on, because you certainly don't want to leave the patient. So, you know, it really does depend on where they are and what they're, what they're doing, but all of those things, you know, in, in, in some way are, are pretty important. So you, you definitely need to, to call the doctor, but if you've got to have a choice, you want to, um, get get the patient in position and then get that one covered up as quickly as possible. So so I guess the, the placing them in the bed with the knees bent if you can, but if they're out in the hall, you may have to just put them out in the hall with their knees bent and then, then tend to the getting the, the sterile dressings. So I don't know. I'm I'm not gonna ask you about the order of it, but you would might have to think about that if that happened to one of your patients. So what what would you do first? I think the best thing to do would be call out for help, don't you? And and so then so you can take care of the patient and then let somebody else make a phone call and get your get your supplies. But that's just my opinion here. Okay. About done with what I want to do. We're just gonna do this one and then we'll uh, and I have another little teeny movie and then we'll be done, won't we? Okay. The factors affecting wound healing. Um, we've already talked about the, the skin is fragile in, in old, older people and in, in tiny infants. 
Um, and uh, the children, we all done your developmental assessment thing. They went through the boo-boos and they, they are just for injury with all of them around and what you and all of this skin tear um, as well to have to deal with or have to have them to deal with. So, um, and you need to make sure and assess their skin, um, especially if they're not, not able to move very much themselves so, and, and uh, assess their skin and turn them um, um, every two hours. It's so frustrating to get a patient that they, they won't move on their own unless you turn them into a, a different position on the left side of the on the left side of the to be on the back, that's the way most people But um, they, they want to be on their back, and then you, you turn them on their side and get the pressure off their back. The next thing you know, they're back on their back, but, but they're not ever going to move off of their back to their side. <laughs> and so, so you, you just really have a, and then you may need to um, try to position those kinds of patients much more often because they can slither into the position that they want to be in and then, then don't, don't ever leave that position. And so you really got, got um, risk for, for skin problems. So. Um, we definitely, with our nutrition, we need either protein, carbs, lipids, vitamins A and C, and iron, copper, and zinc. And there's different places in, in all the different books that tell you different things for, for nutrition. But definitely, I think the real biggies are the protein protein and vitamin C. But if you don't have enough calories with, with the carbs to have you know, energy to to um, so this will support the wound healing, then you know, the, the carbs certainly are important. And we need to have the, um, the lipids too because of the, um, we have essential fatty acids that, that help us that help to, to keep our skin moist and all that and wound healing requires moisture and all that. So, so the lipids certainly do, do count. We really need to have a nice balanced diet and making sure that we got plenty of protein and, and vitamin C in particular for, for the healing. But um, the, all those minerals are, are important too, uh, zinc, copper, and iron. So, and we've already said that the obesity can inhibit the, the healing. We don't have as much blood supply in, in the adipose tissue or the subcutaneous tissue doesn't have much blood supply. Um, you remember when we were doing, um, <coughs> talking about injections, when we're putting, putting medication into the, the subcutaneous tissue versus putting it into the muscle, which absorbs faster? Huh? Yeah, the, mu the muscle does. Why would the muscle absorb quicker? Because the blood supply, right, exactly. And so so um, we, we know that it's going to dissipate in the tissue much slower in the subcutaneous, which that, and that, that can be a good thing. But, but then um, in, in the IM, um, it's, it's going to go, go closer and absorb into the bloodstream because it's more vascular in the muscles. And that's why we do what? With the intramuscular but not with the subcutaneous aspirate. Exactly, yeah. So, so that makes more sense if you look at it like that. Okay, we want to have regular exercise to help our circulation um, and make the wounds heal more more quickly. Uh, why does exercise help? So it's a, yeah, perfusion. It helps to to, um, to bring nutrients to the area if you can exercise. And if, if, you, if you've got an abdominal wound and and you're afraid of dehiscence and all that, you can still do some, some brain devotion and, and things like that. And, and, and early ambulation is still important, even if you've got to do splint or wear a binder. You can wear an abdominal binder. If, if, if somebody's really, really large, and their, their abdomen's going to sort of drag the incision down, they, they may have to wear an abdominal binder to, to walk. But they need to get up and walk and, as, as soon as, as possible. And then we want to, dis we want to discourage them from smoking because it actually decreases what? Yeah, it 
the dot, it decreases oxygen for fusion to the tissues. Exactly. So um, <coughs> the diabetics have decreased perfusion because diabetes can can damage blood vessels. Um, and uh, and then let's see here. Okay. And so medications, I think we've already said this, the steroids and even aspirin can increase bleeding. And so that's that's why aspirin may be something that they don't want you to have uh, around um, cervical time or while you're feeling. And um, the chemo drugs that can decrease platelets and all that. And, and the um, prolonged antibiotic use that can, can encourage the growth of, um, of those uh, um, resistant organisms like MRSA and BRE and, and um, all that kind of thing. Let's see. I tell you what, I'll just start. I'll just start um, tomorrow after the Amanda's thing with our.